Ludovine, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, Sarah. Thank you for having this chat with me. My name is Ludovine Vouters. I'm an advisor for mining companies and investors and increasingly for um, European and US policy shapers on issues of governance, policy relating to criticality and responsibility in mineral value chains. So it sounds like you are the person to come to when asking the question, what is the Critical Minerals Act? The Critical Minerals Act is really the EU's response to the combination of the emerging criticality agenda and the global rush for minerals and the increase in demand from European as well as other industries for all of these minerals, which are integral to the energy and digital transitions. So the goal of the CRM Act is really to shape a European policy response to both uh, structure and inspire all of the member state uh, action, but also to really set a series of targets so that the EU knows where it is heading and what its actions are supposed to bring about in terms of outcomes. So is the Critical Minerals Act in Europe the same as what a critical minerals strategy might be elsewhere in the world? It's a little bit more than that because, first of all, the EU has been working on critical minerals since 2008 with regular updates on a list of critical materials. The The whole point of the CRM Act was to really um, devise not just a strategy. There had been elements of a critical mineral strategy shaped since 2020, but to actually have a policy framework that enables a series of actions. Those actions relate to, first of all, um, how the member states are tackling criticality and what actions they can take, but also it enables a lot of uh, public sector funding and coordination of a lot of incentives and actions. So it's more than a strategy because it also sets a series of um, mandated actions and expectations, which are sometimes very, very clear to the level of defining a certain percentage target on various things. And what has changed recently with regards to the Critical Minerals Act? So the Critical Minerals Act was presented as a proposal by the EU Commission mid-March. Since then, there has been quite a rapid process where the Commission consulted the market. It had already done so before issuing the proposal, but it consulted the market specifically on the proposal. Um, it also presented the proposal to the EU Parliament. The EU Parliament went through a process of studying the proposal through different committees. And this week, yesterday in fact, the committee had rendered its opinion and its proposal to the Parliament in its plenary session, and the Parliament as a whole voted on its position on the CRM Act. So what that means is that you now have the original proposal from the Commission, you have a modified proposal from the Parliament. The next step is for the Parliament, the Commission, and the Council to come together in a process that's called Trilogue, and effectively bash out the final version of the CRM Act. This process has actually been quite expedited, and there is very clearly an objective to get the CRM Act adopted, ideally by the end of the year, at the latest early 2024, so that all of the actions and initiatives that are underway really come under that framework. So the process is happening really quickly at the moment, what does it actually mean to all of the different stakeholders with regards to raw materials, both inside and outside of Europe? Interestingly, the CRM Act does cover both aspects, CRM production, processing and use in Europe, as well as how Europe relates to third parties, to third countries and to strategic partners on this issue. Um, what the CRM Act brings about, and particularly in the, the modifications that have been made by Parliament, is setting a series of goals. So the original goals that were set by the Commission in its proposal in March 
were to strengthen EU capacities, both in terms of production and processing, to increase diversification, to improve risk management across the EU in terms of monitoring stocks and understanding where supply risks could arise, and of course, to optimize circularity and sustainability. What's new in the recent version um, from the parliament is two things. The first one is the parliament put skills and particularly the EU's dire need of a lot of very skilled workers in mineral value chains right at the top of the agenda. So that means that all of the initiatives that drive towards upskilling, reskilling, um, attracting people to these careers are going to get a lot of attention. The second thing that's new is that the parliament added a dimension of reducing or mitigating demand, whether through innovation and substitution, or even increasing efficiency in industrial processes. So that means that the parliament has added a thought process about not only how do we source, but also how do we use minerals, particularly critical minerals. And that is a game changer because there are currently a series of critical minerals initiatives, strategies, and even um, acts and, and legislation around the world. One of the elements that's constantly missing is so much as we can possibly source these, are we making the best use of them? And the fact that this is now a pillar and a goal under the CRM Act puts the EU leagues ahead in terms of thinking about efficiency. The next step of that is sufficiency and really reducing demand by rethinking industrial processes and use. So do you think it's going to work? I think what's interesting about the EU approach is that the EU had set itself really significant ambitions. Um, it's translated those ambitions into non-binding, but let's be honest, extremely potent targets. There are four targets that we need to think about. The first one is 10% of domestic extraction. That's a significant target. It's also very much acknowledged in the EU policy circles that not every mineral can actually be produced up to 10% of annual consumption in the EU. Geology doesn't work to decrease. There's another target of 40% of annual consumption that must come from domestic processing. What's new in the new version of the Act is that the EU will count to that target, not just what it processes inside its borders, but also what is processed in countries with which the EU has a strategic partnership. So already the external component is built in to these targets. The third target is probably the most interesting one because there's been a complete turnaround on that one. And it's a 15% target of annual consumption that had to come from recycling. That target was heavily debated because it was not an incentive to build better products. And it was not the right way to actually stimulate more circularity. So the new proposal is that it's twofold, is that first of all, generally we need to increase by at least 10% the volumes recycled compared to the baseline of 2020 to 2022. So that means that we have to see a growth curve on recycled volumes within the EU. The second aspect of that target is that by 2030, the EU wants to be collecting, processing 45% of the CRM content in its waste. That is a very ambitious target. There is also one final target, which is a diversification target where the EU says we no longer want to source more than 65% of a specific raw material at all levels of the value chain from a single country. Will it work? Well, it really depends on how much effort we put into it. Two things that are important in that regard. The first one is that contrary to what a lot of um, casual observers have said, the EU is not lagging anybody in terms of the capacity to fund all of these efforts. There are significant funds available and actually, the EU has revised all of its um, public state funding 
um, frameworks to facilitate allocation of the necessary monies to the CRM agenda. The second thing that's very important is that there is a clear sense of the urgency, and it's even repeated by the parliament in the latest version. And there is a clear sense that the approach must now be completely um, coordinated between EU institutions, member state institutions, public finance in the EU. And there's also an, an outreach to strategic partners. So the EU is giving itself the best shot it can, I think. And so what's going to happen next? So two things happen next. The first one is we continue on the adoption process. So the Parliament, the Commission and the Council get together and come out with a final version of the CRM Act. The other thing that happens is that whilst we've been adopting the Act, the EU has already been progressing with strategic partnerships on CRM. So the EU has already been entering into a series of agreements with resource-rich countries from Canada to Kazakhstan, Namibia, Argentina, and a series of others. What's going to happen next is a clear acceleration of those efforts because external action is very much a huge part of the CRM agenda. So what we should see is a lot more EU CRM diplomacy and a lot more mobilization around CRM as an element of the energy transition and as an element of the EU's climate positioning. So we have legislation, but also a whole lot of positions internationally from the EU. Thank you very much, Ludovine, for explaining to us something that could be incredibly complicated in a very succinct manner. Thank you very much. Thank you.